within yourself other than uh, inspiration because inspiration, it has an ending point. It has a duration of time in which it will exist and then go. Every single day, what you had yesterday could be completely erased in today. Mark chapter 4 was talking about how the word of God could be taken out of somebody's heart. Now that's very, very important. It's an urgent matter to recognize that what God places in you could be taken from you. Restoration is a powerful anointing of God because it's God placing back in you what the enemy was allowed by you to take from you. So in the anointing of restoration, oftentimes you hear restoration, but, but restoration, the Holy Spirit was talking to me about this late night. Restoration is where God replants you where you was unplanted or uprooted. It's where God places back in you what you lost. When David said he restoreth my soul, David is saying my soul lost things that he placed in it. But he just was merciful to me and replanted it in me again. So restoration is God letting you regain what was tarnished, what was removed. So restoration is really the recovery of impartation. Restoration is the recovery of impartation. It's the recovery of things that you're supposed to remember. Things you're supposed to conduct. Things you're supposed to ponder upon. Things you're supposed to speak. Things you're supposed to sow. So when God restores you, he's placing back in you what was taken. But remember, um, what's taken from a person is permitted by them. So your, your soul, your body, everything is like a house. And only you can unlock the door for the house to be uh, sieged and, and things will be taken. The goods, the treasures will be taken out of the house. Well, what is the treasures? It is the words that God speaks to you that reveal to you your true purpose, your true assignment. So... I receive restoration from you, Holy Spirit. Restoration, when you pray for restoration, Father, restore me. Remember what David was saying, restore unto me the joy of salvation. That means that he had joy. He let the joy go. He permitted it to be accessible. So he's saying, restore unto me. Place back that joy that I had that I let the serpent have access to and take from me. You know, there's something that happens in basketball. If you catch the ball and the ball is accessible to the other person, they can grab it. And when they grab it, if they don't utterly take it from you, the ref will call a jump ball, which means now they have access to get the ball from you. But they only could get access to that ball is if you're exposing the ball. So say you catch the basketball. If you don't bring it into security, if you don't guard the ball, they could put their hand on the ball. And once they put their hand on the ball, if they don't be successful in taking it from you, they'll get a jump ball where they can take it from you. Well, the same way. When the Spirit of God is telling you things, if you don't take it and hide it, if you don't hide it in your heart, 
is still accessible to spirits that used to own you. So they could take it from you at any given time. So when things are taken from a person, it's not because the devil just so powerful and it's unfair. No, no. It's taken from them because they didn't value it to secure it. So it was accessible. So the enemy pits the enemy's hands on it. And now is accessible to be taken from you. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 7. It says in verse 3, sorrow is better than laughter. For by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. What is this talking about? It's saying that sorrow is better than laughter. Is the Bible contradicting itself by saying that sorrow is better than laughter? Because we see in Proverbs that laughter doeth good like a medicine. So I want you to understand the different definitions of laughter. Because at the cross, they were laughing at Jesus. This laughter is not the medicine of God. This laughter is the puffing up of the flesh, the worship of the devil, being a scorner. What this Psalm chapter 1 says, Blessed is that man that sitteth not in the seat of the scornful. No, no, where is that? Where is that? Is that Psalm 1? It says, Blessed is the man that uh, standeth not in the way of sinners, that sitteth not in the seat of the scornful. This laughter is demonic laughter. It's when you are loose, you have no respect for God, you trespass against him, you go beyond what he allows you to do. This laughter is, is the seeking of self. This laughter is the love for self. Psalm 1-1. So when we deal with this Ecclesiastes chapter 7 laughter, this laughter is not the laughter that God gives you from joy. This laughter is the laughter that the enemy gives you so that you will not have respect for the will of God. I want you to think about this. This respect that God gives will go against this laughter. The respect that God gives to you is an enemy to this laughter. So people that have fear of God do not step into this realm of laughter. Wow. My God. Say, are you, are you looking at this here? I'm thinking, I'm thinking real strong on this because I feel a real heavy, heavy, heavy glory on this one. Because saints, where, where have you ever heard this before? Throughout the course of your life, have you understood this, that laughter has different, de different definitions? So the sorrow? Because we're looking at this sorrow is saying that sorrow is better than laughter. So obviously this sorrow is at a higher plateau than this laughter. So what is this sorrow? Is this sorrow of the curse? No, this sorrow is of God. Let's go here to Corinthians. Watch this. Watch this here. This is so amazing. Remember the word sorrow. I'm telling you there's different definitions of the word sorrow. And there's different realms to the word sorrow. Because watch 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. Look what it says here. I'm going to show you something. 2 Corinthians Look what it says here. Second Corinthians. Chapter seven, verse 10. Look what it says. For godly sorrow worketh repentance. For godly sorrow worketh repentance. Look what it's talking about. Godly sorrow. It says, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. Wow. My goodness. 
My goodness. This is so powerful. This is so powerful. Oh, this is so powerful. Are you catching this? Apostle Paul literally defined two different sorrows. He said that there's a sorrow that's godly. Then there's a sorrow that's of the devil. So when we go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 3, when it says sorrow, it's talking about godly sorrow. So the person that's in godly sorrow is better than the person that's in uh, laughter, which is mockery of God, because the person that's in godly sorrow, they are turning away from the things that hurt God. The person that's in laughter is proceeding in the things that hurt God. Wow. So the person that's in sorrow, godly sorrow, is making changes. The person that's in laughter is exploring. Oh my goodness. Wow, that's amazing how much how much is in this? You're seeing a new level. That's why Ecclesiastes is a parable book. You need understanding. You need a man of understanding to interpret it. That's, a, that's why there, there's so much things that people are missing in the word of God because they simply don't understand it. And while they don't understand it, the enemy is able to keep a veil over their, their eyes. And that veil is blocking them from pleasing God because they need to know the information. The Bible says, by sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. So people's heart are being made worse because they're in the realm of laughter. So they are disrespectful. They are evil to the Holy Spirit. They are not listening to the Holy Spirit. So their heart is becoming worse and worse and worse. But you see what the word says, by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. So people's heart becomes good when they enter into godly sorrow because they're turning away from things that God is telling them. No, I don't want you to act like this, say like this, think like this, connect with this type of people. I don't want you to be like this. Those people are taking the initiative to make changes. So the word of God is saying that sorrow is better than laughter. Now let's go to verse 4. So, so look what it says by, for by the sadness of the countenance. So you not only find out that there's divine sorrow, but there's divine sadness. Demonic sadness is depression. But divine sadness is deliverance. Remember this wisdom, though, that I'm giving you. My goodness. So the, 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 the demonic sadness is depression. It's oppression. Depression, oppression. Divine sadness is deliverance. Until you become divinely sad, you will never stop doing anything that you're doing that's hurting the God that made you, that disqualifies you from heaven. You know what's so crazy? Despite all this preaching that's going on in the world right now about how, you know, it's not by works that we're saved. And, you know, you know, it's all it's because of the cross and it's because of the blood. That's the only way we're going to get in and dust and dust. It sounds great, right? But really what man is saying is, it doesn't matter what I do on earth. I still going to make it to heaven because of the blood of Jesus. That's a damn lie. Because even your Bible says that the liar and the whoremonger 
and the homosexual and the and the and and and, and, and the person that 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 is uh that is committing sin it says that they will not enter into the kingdom of heaven even the bible in the new testament is saying that people that make certain decisions disqualify themselves from heaven so Satan is infiltrating so much levels, even the religious section, because Satan is trying to widen the population of hell with religious people that really don't want to be saved. They want laughter. Because laughter lets you still disrespect God and follow your flesh. And there's no beating of your flesh. There's no death of your pride. There's no death of your plans. There's no death of your ego. And that's what Satan wants. That's what the doctrine of devils is all about in these last days. How many people can be rounded up so that eternal hell will be their destiny? Just think about it. That's what it's all about. Anything to tell you the wrong information so that you'll continue to wrong God and at the end of your life, you find out you're disqualified even though the blood been shed because the Bible tells you in Hebrews, if you sin willfully, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Which means that when you sin willfully, meaning you know what you're doing, you say, I'm going to do it and you go forth and do it and you keep on doing it, it says that the blood doesn't work for that person no more. The death of Jesus doesn't work for that person no more because that person is, they're abusing the, the sacrifice of Jesus with the knowledge of Jesus, and instead of receiving the blood properly to set them free from the sin, they're using the blood as a means to say in their mind, okay, I'm not going to get no consequence for this because the blood... So now you see twistedness, wickedness, because the same blood that you're saying is powerful that will forgive you and give you eternal life is the same blood that was shed to give you a new lifestyle, a new decision making, a new behavior and conduct. So you want the blood to work for eternal life, but you don't want the blood to work for your life decisions. Mendelize vezo sonuvra ade. Fernando Resti Cariazo no Riendos, Cardiberian. You are wicked if you believe that the blood can get you to heaven. But you don't believe the blood can get you to a right decision when you're tempted. Oh. Oh, that's big. Did you catch that? Like the blood could get you into eternal life. But the blood can't get you into life in your choice of words. Get you into life in your choice of decisions. Get you into life in your choice of relationships. So that you only have relationships that's of life and not of death. So you look at what the devil is doing to the totality of man, even religious man. The devil is all over the place talking to people with wrong doctrines. So that at the end of their life, they'll find out, depart from me. I never knew you. You work of iniquity because it's true that a person could disqualify themselves from heaven and qualify themselves for hell. Or else the Bible wouldn't give you all these labels and tell you they're abominable, will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Why is it telling you this? It's saying that God is going to look at how you live and what you decided. That's going to be the major focus, not the blood of Jesus. <laughs> not the grace of God. People are not going to be judged on the day of judgment for the grace of God. Nobody is going to be judged for no grace of God. 
There's not going to be no grace of God, mercy of God, blood of Jesus as the vocal focus on judgment day. What's going to be the vocal focus is that every man shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of the deeds done in his body, not Christ's body. So it was you that went go smoke. You're not going to be sitting up there on the day of judgment talking about, oh, well, Jesus never smoked, so he is my righteousness. You're going to find out today, Miss Willie. You're going to find out today, sweet Willie. Sweet Willie, free Willie. You're going to find out that that stuff ain't going to slide with the holy sovereign God. He going to tell you, if you believed in my grace, why didn't you let my grace set you free from smoking? If you was a believer in my grace, the grace was power to shift a bad habit into glorious liberty, to shift a wrong behavior into complete excellency, to shift a flaw into perfection. If you believed in my grace. See, if you believe the grace of God, If you believe the grace of God, it beautifies your personality and it beautifies the mental process that you have before you make a decision. It was grace that is operating in Mary Magdalene while she had the cross. It's grace operating in, in John while he's at the cross. It's grace. It's grace that a leper gets healed with nine other men. But this leper comes back and says, no, I want to serve you. I want to thank you. It's grace. Thankfulness discovers new levels of servanthood. And grace is the discovery of new abilities. Understanding grace is understanding an invisible power to do visible things that God likes. <laughs>